Happy Father's Day. And I pray and trust uh, that today will be a very special uh, day for you. We're trying to think of the right things to say this morning. I thought it would be best if I come up with a formula that would help us to be more a godly men, or more godly fathers. Because when you look at this world, this world is in need of godly fathers. And if we're honest with ourselves, even some churches are in need of more godly fathers, more godly men, men that will not only say what is right, but we would do what is right. It becomes easy to tell someone what to do, but we need to let them see it in ourselves. It needs to be demonstrated in our lives. If I were to ask you this morning, could you think of some godly fathers, who would you call? What names would come to your mind? Perhaps most of us will call Abraham. We will say Isaac. We will say Jacob. Even, we probably would even call out Solomon, who in the book of Proverbs chapter 3, he gave wise counsel to his son. Even Joseph, the one that was espoused with Mary, who not only had the Son of God, but raised up the Son of God. Those are men that, that will come to our mind as being godly men, godly fathers. But how many of us? will recognize Noah as being a godly father. I know time will not permit me, but just let me read a few chapters, a few verses in Genesis chapter 6. The Bible says around verse 5, well, let's start at verse 1, and it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters was born unto them. That the Son of God saw that the daughters of men, that they was fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is also flesh, yet his days should be a hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. And God saw the wickedness of man, that it was great in the earth, that every imagination of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And listen what the Lord said. And the Lord said, I will destroy man from whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and every creeping thing in the fowls of the air, for it repented me that I've made them. God was willing to destroy man from the earth. But thank God for verse number eight, because the Bible says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Amen. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now I understand that Noah was a man and he made some mistakes. He made some big mistakes in his life. But 
those mistakes that Noah made, he didn't continue to make them. He changed. And I know he changed because the Bible says that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And not only did he find grace, but Noah was a just man. Noah, life changed. He began to walk with God. And you see, which one of us can honestly say that we've never done any sin? For the Bible declares that we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We all have made some mistakes. Noah made some mistakes, but he did not continue. But as a father, he continued to set the examples. And that's what we have to do as fathers, as men. Even when we make mistakes, we must not continue to make the same mistakes. We must demonstrate and live a life before our children and before our family and let them see that we have a constant walk with God. They must see us. They must hear us and watch how we Treat our wives. Watch how we get up every morning and go to work to supply food and shelter for our families. If our, if our children don't see us doing it as fathers, then they'll grow up and they won't do it. But Noah was a man that continued to walk with God even though he made some mistakes. We have to continue to do what God has required us to do. And if we continue to, to live a life that is pleasing before the Lord, then our children will grow up and they'll be able to understand and see how mom and dad got you it. Oh, it's not always easy. Oh, the days get long. The, the nights get difficult. But we still must continue to do what God has required us to do. How could we ever come to the house of God and tell God? people how to live and how to conduct themselves if we're not doing it at home. We must be godly men. We must demonstrate to our kids and let them know. Take the time to teach them. Let them know that, oh yeah, things, it gets hard. But when it gets hard, we do not turn to the streets. We put all our trust in God. Knowing that the Lord will make a way. It gets difficult sometimes, but God will still provide for us. But they must see us doing it. They must see how we overcome. We can't give in to every wind of doctrine. We, every time something goes wrong, we can't fall out. We have to show them and demonstrate to them that we're walking with God. We're trusting God, knowing that everything will be all right. Paul said in Romans chapter Eight and around verse 28, he says, all things works together for the good. For those that love the Lord, those that are according to his purpose. The Lord has a way of working things out. It doesn't look right at the moment, but he'll work it out. Noah demonstrated that. He, he, he walked. His kids seen him every day preaching and teaching the word of God, which brings me to the second point. Not only do, must we walk in God's word, but we must witness the word of God. We must go out to the highways and the byways and teach them the word of God. We must let our children hear us praying. Our children must see us talking. And when, we, when we're walking with them to the store, we must talk to, take the time to teach them the word of God. Something goes wrong in our life, let them know it's okay, God will fix it for us. We have to share the gospel with others and let them know the grand old story how the Lord came and how he bled and how he died. But he got up early that third day, never to die again. And let them know that one day he's coming back. But when he comes back, the second time. He won't look like he looked the first time. When he came the first time, he rode in on a donkey. But when he comes the second time, he'll be riding on a cloud. When he came the first time, he traveled incognito. That is, folk didn't know who he was. 
But when he comes the second time, every eye shall see him. And every tongue shall confess. When he came the first time, he stood before Pilate. But when he comes the second time, Pilate will stand before him. When he came the first time, he came to redeem us. But when he comes the second time, he'll come to judge us. When he came the first time, they had to decide what to do with him. But when he comes the second time, he'll decide what to do with us. Noah preached 120 years. One message. Three points. Same conclusion. And his message was, it's going to rain. It's going to rain. It's going to rain. It's going to rain. Nor was letting them know that time was at hand. And we must get it right. It's going to rain, church. But not water. The fire next time. And if we continue to walk in the word of God. If we continue to witness the word of God. Then we win our family over. The Bible says that Noah preached 120 years. And the only folk that responded to his preaching was his family. And that's what we must do, brothers. If we don't win anybody else to the Lord, we need to win our family. We need to win them over to the Lord. And then one day, we'll be able to hear him say, well done. Thy good and faithful servant, thy has been faithful over a few faithful. I make every one of his own May God bless you. Yes, May he bless you real good. When you're up against the struggle, meet it squarely face to face. Lift your head, set your shoulders, plant your feet, and take a brace. When it's vain to try to dodge it, do the best that you can do. You may fail, but you may conquer, see it through. This morning, to the fathers, I just want to say happy Father's Day. To the fathers, I just want to say again, happy Father's Day. You see, on this day, I didn't know the lineup that you would have before you. But see, I got the lineup, and it reminded me of a sport in this season, the baseball. You see, in baseball, what you have is you have the coach comes out with the lineup. You got somebody that goes first. You see, Brother Ricky, you started us off. You got somebody that comes behind number second, and it's Charles. You, you kept us rolling. And then you got me at number three coming in this thing. But see, the thing with me at number three, I feel good about because, see, I got a cleanup hitter coming behind me. No matter how I might mess up this thing today, I got a cleanup hitter. You see, it's a song that I know about. Say, I, I, done, I done messed up. I started my life all over again. I done cleaned up what I done messed up. I done started my life all over again. So no matter how I do today, I rest in the shit that I got Brooks behind me to fix this thing on up on today. But to the fathers, I was asked to say just a few things. Just to give you something of encouragement. Something to just get you motivated. You see, fathers, you see, when I was asked to say something on this day, I, I responded back, yes. Yes, I'll do it. But then this week, I begin to think to myself, how can I get out of it? Because you see, on Father's Day, I spend time with my father. I go visit him. I said, you know what, I'll call my father. See, I can use him as an excuse why I don't have to be here today. I say, I could go out of town. That's it, that's it. But then when I talked with my father, I said, hey, I said, hey, hey, dad, I can't come. See, I don't call him father. I said, hey, dad, I ain't going to be able to stay with you on Father's Day. And he said, well, what you mean? Why you can't stay with me? You got to usher or something? I'm like, nah, I ain't got to usher. I just, I kind of brush it off. I got to say something at church. And he's like, wait, wait, what did you say? I said, I got to say a few words at church. And he said, wait, wait. Then he got silent. You see, he didn't say nothing at all. And he said, boy, I done taught you something. So I, put, I poured something into you. When you was born, I gave you my name for I'm Junior. I said, when you, when you got a little bit older, he said, I put something in you by the bedside. I taught you when you was at home. He said, when you got of age, you went to church with me Sunday morning. You went to church with me Sunday night. I taught you in Bible class on Monday. I, you cleaned up the church with me on Tuesday. We went to Bible class again on Wednesday. And I come to you today to say, you're wondering why I got this cup. You see, you see, I try to pour out of the cup, but I can't pour out what ain't in it. But to the fathers, I just want to say, Something was poured in me. Can I pour out of you? Oh, this is the interactive part for you. I need you to say something back to me. To the fathers, listen to me. I need you to say this. Can you say pour on? Pour on. 
One more time. I think I had one father that might have been asleep. Can you say pour on? Pour on. Oh, see, when I come to this glass to get some water, no matter how thirsty that I might be, I can't get nothing from it if there ain't nothing in it. Oh, I know that may not be correct English, but I'm going to speak to you today from the heart. You see, I just want to say, you can't pour out into people what ain't in you. You can't pour out into people what ain't in you. You see, this glass might be fancy. It's a, it's a Starbucks glass. Oh, this gas might, it came from overseas. A friend of mine brought it this way. He gave it to me, maybe Indonesia or something. So I know it cost a little bit of money. But no matter what I look like on the outside, just because I'm dressed up, I got to have something to share to you on the inside. You see, sometimes if all you got is an exterior, all you could be is a trophy on the shelf. And to the fathers, I know there's something on the inside of you. I know you look good. I know you look good. There's got to be something on the inside of you to share with others. And when I think about pouring in, I think about a story in the Bible. Uh, the story in the Bible that I think about is Luke 15 and number 11. It talks about a prodigal son. The prodigal son, you see there was a father that poured, but first off, he had two sons. So in the father having two sons, he poured into those sons. And see, fathers, you may have a child like those, one of those two sons that say, give me what you got. I want it all. But see, the father hadn't died yet, but the father had poured in it. See, the prodigal son that he left, he left and went out. But the father went looking for him each and every day. And I believe he looks for him because of what he poured into his son. See, he knew his son was had to come to himself of what was on the inside of him. But see, the father went every day looking for him. But when he looked for him, the son came to himself. No, oh, he came to him. Thank God that he came to himself for what the father put on the inside of him. See, many times as a kid, sometimes the father feels like I taught you this, but you want to do what you want to do. And we come to ourselves. Fathers, pour on. I just want to say, fathers, continue to pour, no matter what we might do. You see, things ain't always as they seem. As I think about a story, and this is going to be it. If you miss this, you're going to miss it all. If you think about a story, this story is simply this. And the story is there was two angels one day. An old angel and a young angel. They begin to continue on their journey, and they came to a house. You see, but this house was a, it was a mansion, unlike any other house. This house was huge. It was elaborate. It looked like it could have been somebody that was wealthy. The angels knock on the door. The man comes to the door, and the angels say, hey, we're passing this way. Can we stay here on tonight? Well, then the, the man said, yeah, you can stay here, but you can't stay in none of these rooms. These are all my guest rooms. The man looking at him said, you have to stay in the basement. And the angel said, well, that's fine. We just need a place to stay for the night. We're continuing our journey. And so then the angels go down, the younger angel. When the man leaves, the younger angel says to the old angel, he says, you know, this has to be the worst spot in the house for us to sleep. Does, does he not know that we're angels? It's dark. It's dreary. It's just the worst place that we can stay in. Oh, but then they went to sleep that night. As they awaken the next day, you see the angel, younger angel look, and he woke up to the older angel. See, he was fixing a hole in the wall. And the younger angel asked him, said, why are you fixing a hole in the wall of the man with all this money? He wouldn't even let us stay in one of his guest rooms. He said it was for his guests, and he didn't even recognize that we were angels. But you, here you are doing him a favor by fixing a hole. The old angel said to the younger angel, things ain't always as they seem. Oh, but as the story continues, the angels went on their way and left the house. They arrived at another house, which was on a farm. At this farm, it was nothing but it was one cow on this farm. Not sure how much of a farm that is, but it was one cow. The angels arrived at the door and knocked on the door of this house, and it was beginning to be night. But then we say at nighttime, the, the farmer came to the door, and he said he looked at him. But this farm, he recognized him. He said, you are angels. And then the angel said, can we stay here for the night? We'll leave the next day. The man said, yes, you can stay here, but you got to do me a favor. you got to stay in my bed. Me and my wife will stay somewhere else, but I'll give you my bed. And so then the angel stayed there that night. And, but then in the morning, they, they awakened. They awakened to a loud cry. Oh, it was a loud shout that they awakened to. So both angels got up, the young angel and the old angel, they went out. Oh, but when they got to the field, they saw why it was a cry. For the cow had died. The younger angel immediately looked at the older angel and said, what you going to do? 
When we was at the other house, you fixed the hole in the wall. Here it is, we're at this house, and he allowed us to sleep in the bed, but you let his cow die. He was the only cow, how they made their money and profit on that day. They would have no way to get any grain or anything. But then you see the old angel silked at him and said again, things ain't always as they seem. When I was at the, when we were at the rich house, I sealed up the wall. Well, I sealed up the wall because there was a treasure in the wall. The rich man was so besought in what he currently had that I didn't see he deserved on what was inside the wall. Things ain't always as they seem. And so then as he continued on, the old angel said, son, last night while you slumbered and slept, there was a death angel that came to this house. Oh, the death angel wanted the wife. But I gave him the cow. He said, things ain't always as they seem. But to the fathers on this day, it may look like your kids don't hear you. It may look like you're not celebrated. There may not be a long line at, at where you're going to eat today, but that's okay. You may even go in the drugstore and there's still Father's Day's cards still there. You see, Mother's Day is long lines. But on Father's Day, keep on pouring in. You see, no matter what it is, things ain't always at the, as they seem. So to each and every father... Don't give up. Don't get weary. Don't worry about that you may not get the praise or the gift that you deserve. Just remember to keep pouring in. <laughs> keep pouring in. Keep pouring in. Let's give these men uh, another love deposit. I was confident that Eddie was going to do well. I told him, I said, if the, the spirit get a hold to you, just go ahead and keep on running with it. <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm grateful to be able to stand here with, uh, before you as these rest of these men have come to uh, try to uh, offer a word of encouragement to our men uh, and to our men we say, Happy Father's Day. And we're grateful to be able to stand before you to give you a word of encouragement. I'm going to uh, try to drop a little bit off to you from Genesis chapter 18. And in Genesis chapter 18, we see a lot going on that is very familiar to our world. Far too many men go through life without recognizing their spiritual mission. Uh, see, the way God picked Abraham, he has chosen you for his kingdom and desires for you men to accomplish great things through you. God has always sought out and uh, utilized men to achieve his kingdom agenda throughout history. Uh, and, and see, Satan is well aware of this, which is why he wishes to confine and emasculate men. The enemy plans to modify the definition of a man by uh, portraying complacency as a virtue, making mediocrity the aim, and to lull, lull men into spiritual sleep. This culminates in the conclusion that there is a significant difference between being a male and being a man. Uh, but let's take that a step farther there is still a significance between being a man and being a true man, a true man in accordance with uh, God's concept of biblical manhood. Can I get an amen somewhere? Uh, the remainder of what I'm going to say about, uh, about men uh, may be unsettling if you feel that you believe that you don't meet the standards for being a true man, a kingdom man. Prayerfully, instead, it will raise you up and lift you up and urge you to press on to your due place as a true man, a kingdom man. One who doesn't feel afraid to answer God's call on your life in order to achieve his kingdom agenda through your hands. Yeah. Kingdom men recognize that God created them. He created us to be great. He created us to lead and for us to benefit all those who come underneath our influence. 
when men learn how to lead under God, we will see God work out his plan for our lives and for our lives uh, will have influence over our families, over our churches, and over our communities. The fight for manhood has caused havoc in many aspects of our lives. Males' unwillingness or failure to become men as God defines them, going beyond their plumbing in order to define themselves as God defines us, causes turmoil on all levels. Amen. Although there are numerous exceptions to this rule, however, the reality is when you look at the scope of the decline of marriages, of churches, and the, the decline of the culture, much of it can be connected with the absence Amen. of Adam. Amen. Men, being not, men not being in their God-given spaces. Yeah. Because men are nowhere to be found. The world is crumbling. And when there's no men, God's judgment on culture will undoubtedly follow. When you look in Gen, uh, excuse me, when you look in Ezekiel 22 verse 30, the Bible says, "God said, I searched for a man among them who would build up the wall and stand in the gap before me in the land, so that men say, so that, so that. I would not destroy it, but I found no one. If God couldn't find a man." to stand in the gap for the entire nation, then finding a true man must be difficult. The same appears to be true now. There are plenty of guys and plenty of boys to go around, but there are not many men, which also makes it difficult to find many fathers. Jeremiah 5, 1 says, run to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem. See if you can find a man and they could not find the one. Which means for all practical purposes, you can be a male and not be a man. And so in Genesis 18, we see that uh, we have a civilization that is in disorder and in ruin, preparing to face judgment. All of Sodom and Gomorrah's troubles were caused by man. Homosexuality was the norm, number one. And number two, they were rapists. And then number three, three, they were oppressors of the poor. And God looked down and saw the outcry of the depravity, the horrible collapse of society, and he had prepared to condemn it. You see, God created man first, and he will be the one that God looks at first. See, Abraham was living in this deteriorating culture and the same time you and I are living in this dying culture now. For the same three reasons, God gives him three things. In the middle of the, this depravity, in the midst of this cultural collapse, God says, I found me a man. I have chosen him for a purpose. And we know this because in Genesis 18, 17, the Bible says, shall I conceal what I'm about to do from Abraham? Uh, in other words, he says, I'm up to something. And I have found a man uh, to help me do what I'm going to do. The idea uh, is that some things God desires to do, he cannot do because he cannot find a man. Um, well, at least he can't accomplish it the way he wants to accomplish it because Adam that I'm searching for is missing. The first thing that every man has to realize is that your manhood is divinely planned. When a man chooses Jesus as Lord and Savior and God has added him to the body of Christ, he commissions, he is now commissioned into God's plan. Unfortunately, Many men who attend church are uninterested in God's purpose. And when this happens, they live distracted in the purpose of culture. And you're surrounded by culture. And you're surrounded by your own aspirations. 
or what you learned from your father who failed to center his life and purpose on God. And then you'll construct your own purposes and get distracted from God's plan. Now, now, not every man is this way, but many men, far too many men are here. Why? Because Adam walked with God in the cool of the day. He understood that when, uh, that when he was placed in the garden, what God intended for him, he did. He said, this is the garden. This is your home. This is what I want you to do. He walked with God in the cool of the day. Why? Uh, and before this uh, rebellion against God, he walked with God in the cool of the day. So God was free to tell them what he was up to. God has a plan for every man in here. Uh, and he's, he can't tell you what he's up to because you're not walking with him in the cool of the day. You're just here to visit him on a Sunday. He says, I have some things that I'm going to hide from you. Uh, I'm, I'm going to hide from Abraham because he has chosen and set him apart. He's not going to hide him from Abraham. Now, the first thing a real man, a kingdom man, must understand is that you have a divine design for God's glory and the expansion of his kingdom, which includes all the stuff that he has planned for you. Proverbs 20 and 5 says, conceal in the heart of man is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. In other words, God puts purpose in the heart of every man, but it's up to us to draw it out. God has given you a reason to be, to, uh, reason to be in seed form, but it's up to you to grow it out in pursuit of relationship with him. It is not due to your strong education. It is not due to your business acumen. It is not due to your uh, academics or being on the right side of the track. See, it came to Adam because he was in tune with God. It came to Abraham because he was in tune with God as a way of life, not just a visit. Men, today we have to be living in purpose, on purpose. And it's far too long that we have not. We, can't talk, we can talk about our careers, but we can't talk about uh, the Lord. We can talk about all our business goals and our finances, but when you ask a man, what is God's purpose for you, he gets quiet. Because we spent far too much time in the world and not enough time alone with God. The second thing that we need to see in Genesis 18, 19, is that he says, for I have chosen him so that, every man say so that, so that. he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that, every man, so that. the Lord may bring upon Abraham what he has spoken about him. Let me fix, let me fix this and help us understand this. It's, the, it's that the problem is that in the culture, we say that women are supposed to discipline and raise the children. See, this comes from the culture, but it, it doesn't come from scripture. He said, I command Abraham to raise the children to teach them righteousness and justice. Might be why when it came to Isaac getting on that altar, he did it in obedience. Now, I'm not sure uh, if there was an issue, but the Holy Spirit, I believe, would have told Moses to write that so we could understand and see the humanity of Isaac's struggle. But instead, we see righteousness. In Ephesians 6, 4, Paul tells the fathers to raise your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. In scripture, it is the job of the man to raise the children, not the woman. Amen. Deuteronomy, when Moses gives the instruction to the men in teaching, he says, teach your sons and your, son and your grandsons. Why didn't he say teach your daughters and your granddaughters? Why is it sons and sons so much as in scripture? Not because daughters wasn't in, and granddaughters weren't important. Why is it sons and sons? Because the sons were to be prepared to replicate, uh, to, to duplicate the father and the families that they might be able to uh, be able to soon establish their own. So pour into, pour into. The sons, because most cases, when you do that and the, and the men get it straight, then the women are going to follow because they were built that way Amen. to help fulfill God's purpose in a man. 
And when men reject to be what God wants them to be, it causes dysfunction and disaster in the family, in the relationship, in the culture, and in the children, and the result of the lost generations and abandoned men. And we have men who can tell you all about football and nothing about scripture. They can quote you all the stats of their favorite player, but can't tell you their favorite verse. They can tell you all about the parts of a Napier, a Deltic six-cylinder engine attached to the three crankshaft and a triangle for configuration, which is set apart in two pistons sharing a single combustion chamber, but can't tell you about the triune God who loves and cares for you in the way that he loves and cares for you as a father while you're able to be confident because he's a life-giving spirit and understands your issues because he's also the God-man who is uh, acquainted with all your sorrows and pains. And this is not to beat up on men, but to teach us where we went wrong. Bishop, you, you sound a little rough on the brothers today in this Father's Day. But that might be the problem. Uh, I added to the problem. We realize that it is difficult out here for the brothers. And just because it is difficult, we can't pacify the reality that it doesn't change the fact that, brothers, we need, still need to rise up to our God-given divine purpose yes, Amen. and order for the house to get right, in order for the church to be right, and the culture to get right. And let me close. He said, teach them righteous. And I, I just need another few minutes. Uh, he said, teach them righteousness and justice. Don't miss this. Righteousness is your right standing before God. That's your vertical standing before God, your walk, your daily living. That's your cool of the day, walk with God. Walk before the Lord, living to please God, setting a spiritual standard in the home so that everyone knows about your relationship. It's public knowledge and awareness. And then he says, teach justice. See, righteousness is your obedient walk. It's public. Justice is your equitable treatment with man. That's horizontal. So teach them justice, how to treat people, how to be fair to people, how to respect people, how to honor people. This is supposed to come from the father to the son. It's supposed to come from the father to his children. And this is why he made man a little stronger vessel because man ought to be able to carry this kind of weight. The nature of the foundation is not pretty, but it's, 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 it's about how much weight it can hold. Number one, he says, there's a purpose. There's destiny for the man. Number two, there's a responsibility of discipline and discipleship for the man. And then uh, the third thing he says is so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoke about him. I wish I had time, more time to spend in that text, but he said, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. And he said, I got to bring that to him. And so the first so that was about knowing your purpose. And the second so that is for God to deliver your purpose. And I know you might think about your past and you, know, you might think about why I messed up. And yeah, Adam messed up. But praise God, God took an animal and sacrificed him and took the skins of that animal to cover up Adam's mess up. And he's able to cover up any mess up you've had in your life. Um, there is... Um, a man by the name of Thomas Anderson. And Thomas Anderson was a computer programmer. Uh, Willie, he was a computer programmer, part-time hacker. <laughs> and uh, a series of events occurred and Mr. Anderson was swept away 
into a computer-generated reality called the Matrix. And in the Matrix, he meets this man named Morpheus. And Morpheus tells Mr. Anderson, AKA Neo, he says, we've been waiting for you. He says that we have been looking for you because we've been waiting on you because there's a war going on back here in this world. See, there's a war going on between Zion and the machines. And we've been waiting on you because we believe that you're the one. And, and we believe that you are the one that's going to come here and to change the trajectory of what's been going on between Zion and the machine world and the machines because this world is in chaos. And he explains to Neo all the dynamics of what was going on, the dynamics of this new way of thinking, this new way of living, and then he offers him a choice. He says, in this hand, I got a blue pill. And if you take this blue pill, when you wake up, you can go back to your ordinary life, being an ordinary man, and doing ordinary things. And you won't even remember this situation as nothing but a dream. But then he said, in this hand, I got a red pill. And if you take this red pill, then you're going to be able to do things that are far beyond anything you thought possible. You're going to have powers that you can never imagine to be able to do. He said, you take this red pill, it's gonna have you, you're gonna be able to fall in love with this woman named Trinity, who, who you can only dream of. But also if you take this red pill, you're gonna have a problem. And that problem name is Mr. Smith. And Mr. Smith has the ability to change and replicate and duplicate himself over and over and over again. But if you take this, red pill, you have the ability to overcome him. The question is, which pill do you want? Are you going to take this blue pill and go back to your complacency, to your normal life, your ordinary life, and continue to do ordinary things? Or are you going to take this red pill and receive power that you didn't have, ability that you don't have, strength that you didn't possess, and a relationship that you couldn't even imagine? Neo took the red pill. And when Neo took the red pill, or Morpheus said, then let's go ahead and see how far this rabbit hole is going to go. And I stand before you today to ask all the men in this place, which pill did you want? Which pill do you want to take? Are you going to take the blue pill and just be an ordinary man and just show up to church and just live and exist? Or are you going to take this red pill and be an extraordinary kingdom man and be all that God has given you to be and, and have all the power that God has given you to possess so that you can do all that he calls you to do? What pill are you going to take? Stonecrest men, all my men stand up. All my men stand up. All my men stand up. I need to, we need to know what kind of man we have here. All my men, what pill are you going to take? Are you going to take a blue pill? Are you going to take the red? See, let me, let me tell you what the red, maybe perhaps the problem was I didn't tell you what the red pill was. The red pill is coming from the blood of the lamb. The blood of the lamb that's going to wash you and cleanse you of all your infirmities, all your past mistakes, and allow you to be pro propelled into your greatness of being a kingdom man for God. And so I invite any man here, if you feel a, as you've been a failure to your family, a failure in your life, take the red pill, the cross of Jesus Christ, and let Jesus give you the power that only he can give you and propel you to greatness, put you back in your proper space of being a kingdom man, a God man, Forget about your failures. Yeah, you messed up in the past.
but he can set you free. He can set you free and help you stand on the foundation that he purposed you to be in. Take the red pill and be with Christ. Now, I got to also extend the invitation for those who may not know Jesus. You also can accept the red pill. You do that by believing that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, that he died on the cross for your sins and that those sins that he uh, died for, he's going to take away those old sins, your current sins, and any future sins. Amen. Believe that Jesus is the Christ. <clears throat> Repent of your sins means to change your way. Get out of that old world and come into this new world. And then confess the sweetest name that ever was spoken on mortal tongues. Not just confess it with your mouth, but confess it with your lifestyle. Right? And be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. And you too will receive the Holy Spirit that can make you new and can give you all the power to walk in the newness of life. Let us all stand as together we sing the song of the